Hi, I'm Dave Mitchell, uh, coming from Calvary Church, Santa Ana. And uh, it's a privilege to uh, be able to share God's Word with you. This is a what we call Pastor's Bible Study. And so this is really a study. Uh, we dig into the Scriptures. We spend a lot of time reading through the Scriptures and understanding them. And uh, we don't take a lot of uh, tangent trips onto other things, but uh, want us to understand what God has said for us. And so this is a continuation of that, and we call it Learning from the Bible that Jesus Used. I love this passage that we start with each time from Luke chapter 24. This would have been uh, really, Jesus would have said this about next uh, week, where he said after the resurrection, he said, These are my words which I spoke to you. While I was still with you, so this is before the crucifixion, Jesus said things to them, that all things which are here are the key written about me. We're looking into the Old Testament, the passages of the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible in particular, where Jesus says there were things written about him. We want to discover what are those things that God had written about Jesus in those passages of the Law of the Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, the way the Hebrew Bible is organized today. Jesus, that's the Bible that Jesus used. He would quote from it, for example, like the book of Isaiah. And then he says this to them. He says, then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. So I'm not going to pretend to understand everything that Jesus intended by that sentence, but it's very intriguing to consider what are those things in the Old Testament, these wonderful Old Testament books of the Law of Moses, the Prophets, and the Psalms, the writings, the poetic books. What is it about those books that he would have opened their minds to understand? So that's kind of the premise of how we're going through this. Not so much an Old Testament survey or necessarily a book study of chapter by chapter, but to understand and grasp some of the things that Jesus might have said as it relates to this particular passage and his promise of the things that were written about him. And here is the Hebrew Bible, the way it's organized today. This is the Bible that Jesus would have used and the scriptures that he would have uh, seen in those three sections that he referenced. And today we're going to come to a particular man by the name of Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a unique and very difficult book to understand. Now, in this times, we're living in a pretty tough time. The pandemic, the COVID-19 virus, uh, people are losing their jobs. People, are, some are losing their lives. Some are terribly sick. And uh, families are going through pretty just distressful times. So to think about studying Ezekiel seems like a little bit of out of uh, ordinary. I hear people quoting Jeremiah. We studied Jeremiah last week. I also hear people quoting Isaiah, the Passion Week. Isaiah speaks about Christ. I don't hear a lot of people quoting from Ezekiel, but I want to show you why even coincidentally, as I've been going through this since last September, we come to Ezekiel at this time of the pandemic and some of the distress that people are experiencing. Let's look at Ezekiel, knowing that in the context in which we live, he can share. He, he would sympathize with us, and I'll show you why that is. So here's some basic things about Ezekiel. In fact, I have an outline that is always, always available to download it from the website, and uh, you will have a lot easier time following along, and a lot of these things I throw on the slide will also be on that handout to help you as we go through this passage, because I know if you're a little bit like me, my mind will tune in and out, and I'll sort of drift, and then I'll come back to it. So the outlines kind of help us stay focused, because we can review those things and remember them from what we've heard. Here's some things about Ezekiel. Ezekiel is a man, uh, he's a prophet, he's a priest. His name means God will strengthen. He served in this period of time that is from 593 B.C. to 571 B.C. And I point that out, not just an historical fact, but what was significant about that time in which Ezekiel lived. Ezekiel lived during the time when the tribe of Judah, the two southern tribes, Judah and Benjamin, were being overrun by the country of Babylon, what we call Iraq and Iran today. They're coming in and totally wiping out the two southern tribes uh, we reference as Judah. And it was devastating. In 605 B.C., King Nebuchadnezzar came in from Babylon and began to steal away the people and bring them into his land of Babylon. They become exiles, as they're referred to in the scriptures. And one of those that was in 605 B.C. was Daniel. Daniel was taken back to Babylon and served there to about 85 years old. So he served a long time during Babylon and Persia when it became the power that overtook Babylon. Then 597 B.C., there was another group of people that King Nebuchadnezzar took from Judah. In 597 B.C., Ezekiel was taken captive, and he was brought into the land of Babylon. And then in 586 B.C., 
the city of Jerusalem, the temple was utterly destroyed. It was a devastating. It was their 9-11, if you can relate to that. It was complete wipeout of the community. Thousands and thousands of people died, and it was a miserable setting for them. Well, 586 B.C., as you can see, is right between 593 and 571. So Ezekiel was living in the land of Babylon. He had been taken against his will as an exile. He's been forced to go to Babylon. And during that time, he hears the devastating tale of the destruction of the city that he loves, the temple in which he would worship, and it's just totally wiped out. So he's going through a very miserable time. It's not a pandemic in the sense that we live through it, but it's a time of great distress and hardship. You might remember the last Wednesday night we went through the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel were all contemporaries. They all lived at the same time. Each had their role to play. Jeremiah and Ezekiel were prophetic. They were giving out the voice of God. Daniel was living in a strategic time in the political high offices of the land of Babylon. And then Persia, and God had favor upon him. He lived a very holy and righteous life. And God blessed him with prosperity there in that role as he was obedient to God. In fact, you might remember last week I talked about Daniel. Uh, in Daniel chapter 9, verses 1 and 2, and in Daniel 9, the year is 539 B.C., it's there that Daniel reads from the scriptures of Jeremiah. And when he reads Jeremiah, he says, my goodness, this time of exile is about to be exhausted. Because in 536 B.C., the 70 years that God had predicted that they would be in exile was about to come to an end. So because Daniel read in scripture what God had promised at 70 years, he prayed, God, please, please bring us out of this exile. God heard his prayer. And they were delivered from exile. And so the king of Persia, who was Cyrus at the time in 536 B.C., actually paid then to have the temple rebuilt. You might recall that. But it just shows how these people all worked together to be the voice in the hands of God to help his people go through exile, to go through the distress of this really ruinous time of their lives, and to help them to be able to cope and to come out of it. Ezekiel is going to show us how to do that as well. But I want to read what Jeremiah wrote. Was he, this shows the distress factor of the times in which they lived. Here's Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 20. It says, verse 14. And this is hard to read because Jeremiah was a godly man, a sainted man who believed in the power of God, believed that God was in tr control. He's controlling all things. He had his faith in him resting deep. And yet we can all reach those points where it just feels like I'm at the breaking point because of the stress that was surrounding them during this period of time. So Jeremiah writes this, Cursed be the day when I was born. Let the day not be blessed when my mother bore me. Cursed be the man who brought the news to my father, saying, A baby boy has been born to you and made him very happy. But let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew without relenting. And let him hear an outcry in the morning and a shout of alarm at noon, because he did not kill me before my birth, so that my mother would have been my grave and her womb ever pregnant. Why did I ever come forth from the womb to look on trouble and sorrow, so that my days have been spent in shame? That's Jeremiah chapter 20, verses 14 through 18. That's tough. And I just want us to appreciate what these men like Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel are going through. There are hard times in which they're living, just like we're living in hard times. And we can reach that point. Even people of great and deep faith and biblical knowledge and a sense of God's presence and His truth in our hearts, we can still hit the breaking point. So God understands that. And he, so he gives us these words that, that have high relevance for the times in which we live. Sometimes we don't think about going to Ezekiel as a place of biblical resource, but it is a wonderful section of God's truth. So you can see the hardship that Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Daniel were going through. And so therefore, it gives a little bit of a context as to how these things are unfolding. So we see these truths, and that's where Jeremiah 20 was in great despair. And he lived amongst the people there in, by, the, by the river. And uh, here's a little map of the area. And this was Babylon in, and then Persia. But right in this area between Iraq and Iran, this little area of the river, uh, that's where they lived. And so they were taken captive from Israel and brought all the way over here. And uh, I have not been to that specific spot, but I know there's lots of section of land there that I have no 
interest in living in or even touring. And so you can imagine that Ezekiel is living in this place by this river, and it's a very desperate time in which he is living. So here's God's desire. God's desire is that they would know that I am the Lord. This, this phrase is used 60 times in Ezekiel. He repeats it over and over and over again. In fact, there's a lot of repetition in the book of Ezekiel because he says, I I'm not here to punish you. I'm not here to make your life miserable as you go through this time of captivity and exile. I simply want you to know me. And that's what God's inviting us into. In fact, the passage we're going to look at today or tonight is all about knowing God better. So it's interesting what God's focus is as we look at this. And here is the problem. If you take from Ezekiel chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, this is repeated over and over again as well. It's the problem with the people in Judah and part of the reason why they're taken captive in 586, the city is, destro is destroyed. It says this, Then he said to me, this is, God said to Ezekiel, Son of man, I'm sending you to the sons of Israel, to a rebellious people who have rebelled against me. They and their fathers have transgressed against me to this very day. I'm sending you to them who are stubborn and obstinate children, and you shall say to them, thus says the Lord God. Now, that's not a happy ministry. That's not a sense of saying, boy, God, I can't wait to beat with, meet with those people, those rebellious people. He calls them thorns and thistles and sitting on scorpions later in, in Ezekiel chapter, Ezekiel chapter 2. Uh, those those are not circumstances that I as a pastor would gleefully enter into. And sometimes God places us in situations and circumstances that are hard. And it helps us to be able to know what it means to trust Him. But it's based upon what we know about Him. And that's what we're going to learn today as we look at Ezekiel. Here's kind of the big picture of Ezekiel. In chapters 1 through 24, God judges Judah. And so it's all this heavy-handed, God says, I want you to understand who I am. And sometimes he has to get our attention in difficult circumstances. And then he goes and judges the Gentile nations. Sometimes we think, well, the Gentile nations like Babylon that came with Nebuchadnezzar and wiped out Judah, well, they sort of get off. No, they don't. God comes back and he actually punishes Babylon for what they did to Judah. So God has a sense of justice that we may not always understand here on earth. And then the last portion of the, of the book of Ezekiel is that God offers hope for the future. And that's chapters 33 through 48. There's hope for new leaders, new life, and a new land. And here's what I'm planning to do. As I thought about this book of Ezekiel, there's a lot that I want to cover. I begin to talk too fast and people say, slow down, Dave. And so I'm going to slow down. So what I'd like to do today is to take that first section of Ezekiel, and we're going to spend most of the time in, in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 2. And then next week I'm going to come back, and I want to outline for you the hope that God gives to the people of Israel. That that's a real hope. That's a hope that you and I can enter into. There's a future in that. And so I want you to see that, and so I'm going to break that down in spe specific detail to help you to understand it and help all of us to sort of grasp what God is saying there. It's a difficult book because it's filled with visions, it's got uh, figures of speech and uh, poetry, and so it's very difficult to get through it. We're not going to cover every chapter. So I'm going to focus on just chapters 1 and 2. And chapter chapter 1 of Ezekiel 1, 1, 1 I should say, is this. Notice what Ezekiel 1, 1 says. Let me read from the text. In fact, I'm going to read through the chapter. Just listen to this. It's difficult to understand. We're going to go back and look at it in greater detail. In Ezekiel chapter 1, it says, Now it came about in the 30th year on the fifth day of the fourth month, while I was by the river Shebar, which I just showed you on the map, among the exiles, the heavens were opened, and I saw visions of God. On the fifth of the month, in the fifth year, the King Jehoiakim's exile, and King Jehoiakim, you might remember, I talked about him, that's also known as Jeconiah or Kaniah, the curse that God put upon him, that none on his, uh, from his lineage would ever sit on the throne of David. And that goes to Joseph's line, whereas Mary's line in Luke 3 allows us to see the throne of David through her. Well, it says, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest. So he's both a priest and a prophet. He's about age 30, and that's when the priest would typically begin their ministry. He is the son of Buzi in the land of the Chaldeans, which is another way of saying Babylon, by the river of Kibar. And there the hand of the Lord came upon him. And this is what God reveals to him. This is perhaps maybe the most difficult chapter in the Bible. 
So listen as I read, and you might read along in your own Bibles as well. If you have, might have a different translation, sometimes you hear different things as well. As I looked, behold, a storm wind was coming from the north, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it. And in its midst, something like a glowing metal in the midst of the fire. Within it, there were figures resembling four living beings, and this was their appearance. They had human form. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Their legs were straight and their feet like, like calves' hoof, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Under their wings on the four sides were human hands. As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another. Their faces did not turn when they moved, and each went straight forward. As for the form of their faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right, and the face of a bull on the left, and all four had the face of an eagle. Such were their faces. Their wings were spread out above. Each had two touching one another being, and two covering their bodies, and each went straight forward. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go, without turning as they went. In the midst of the living beings, there was something like, that looked like the burning coals of fire, like torches darting back and forth among the living beings. The fire was bright, and lightning was flashing from the fire, and the living beings ran to and fro like bolts of lightning. Now, as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings, for each four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling beryl. And all four of them had the same form like their appearance and workmanship being as if one wheel were within another. Whenever they moved, they all moved in the four directions without turning as they moved. As for the rims, they were lofty and awesome. And the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Whenever the living beings moved, the wheels moved with them. And whenever the living beings rose the earth from the earth, the wheels also rose. Wherever the spirit was about to go, they would go in that direction. And the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Whenever those went, these went. And whenever those stood still, these stood still. And whenever those rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them. For the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. Perfectly clear, right? Well, that's what we want to try to understand. Very difficult. Why in the world does Ezekiel begin his book with something that is almost impossible to understand? Well, here is what I believe Ezekiel is giving to us, to you and me, even to this day, even with the circumstances in which we live here all around the world. God has commissioned Ezekiel to go out there and be a servant of his, to be a prophet, to be a priest. So as he sends him out, what God says to Ezekiel is, I want to reveal to you who I am. I want you to know me before you go out and know the people. I want you to know me before you go out and share God's truth to the people. So it's important that when we go through difficult circumstances, we have faith in someone who is a living being, who is revealing himself to us, who is somehow helping us to understand him a little bit better, even as difficult as that may be, so that we always have a foundation of faith in an almighty God that has revealed himself, that is presently with us to help us to go through that experience. Without that foundation, we live in a pretty, you know, what Jesus might say is on sand, sandy soil, where there's nothing you can build your life upon that. And so let's go through this passage and see what is God wanting us to understand as he gives us this truth. So God calls Ezekiel from this vision. He sees who God is in 1.1. It shows here that uh, there is this vision of God. He says, I saw a vision of God. And then in verse 2, you notice here, he hears a word from God. And it says, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel. And then in uh, verse 3, he also says, and there the hand of the Lord was upon him. He saw God, he heard God, he felt God. And when we go through any circumstance in exile, 
Maybe you feel like you're in exile being sort of homebound. You can't go out and do what you want to do. Well, they, they had their own kind of crazy exile, not in their homes, but in a foreign land's home, and they couldn't get back home. But here's Ezekiel by this river in the middle of the desert, and he sees God, he hears God, he experiences God, and says, Ezekiel, I'm going to send you out to a pretty tough assignment. This is not going to be easy. You're going to be frustrated. I'm frustrated, God says. But I want you to know me. I want you to see me, hear me, and experience me. It's so key to begin any kind of, any kind of ministry, any kind of life that we would live, to be built upon those three factors. Seeing God, hearing God, experiencing God. So that's what Ezekiel, begin, Ezekiel begins with in Ezekiel chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. So that's the foundation, and then God begins to reveal himself to them. So notice some of these texts. It says in verse 4, As I looked, behold, a storm was coming from the north. This, this may be some sort of a vision of, of Babylon coming into Jerusalem, coming from the north. It might be stirring up this, this thought of some power that is coming towards them. But more clearly, a great cloud with fire flashing forth continually and a bright light around it and in its midst something like the glowing metal in the midst of the fire. And what we're going to begin to see is this is the, the glory of God that is coming upon Ezekiel. That God wants to reveal his glory to him. The very essence of who God is. That, he, that he's not hidden from him, but that he has revealed to him. Because everything that he does, as I said, it's based upon his knowledge of who God is. Knowing him better helps him to serve him better. And then we continue through the passage in verses 5 through 9. And within it, there were figures resembling four living beings. These are, these are four angels. And I put Ezekiel 10, 1 up there. It's in the notes there. Because Ezekiel 10, 1 reveals that these four living beings are the cherubim. Cherubim is a very special class of angels. They are the angels that protect the holiness of God. They're intimate around God. Uh, they have experienced God. They've seen God. They've heard God. And here are these cherubim coming to reveal God's glory to Ezekiel. That's how he begins his ministry. This is like graduation day from his seminary as he gives him this calling and this beautiful picture of God. So these four living beings, and this is their appearance. They had human form, and, and we've seen angels. They come and they look in human form as they would visit Mary and Joseph as they were giving birth, uh, being told about the conception to give birth. Each of them had four faces and four wings. Uh, that's very unusual, and you'll see that it's not that unusual in Scripture. Their legs were straight and their feet were like calves' hoof and they gleamed like burnished bronze. Sometimes bronze is, is a picture of, of judgment, of, of God coming of, and uh, carrying out his will uh, to be able to judge the situation in which we are living. And then it continues with this. Under their wings of the four sides were the human hands. As for the faces and the wings of the four of them, their wings touched one another and their faces did not turn when they moved each way and they went straight forward. And so what we see is this very unusual image of the cherubim with the faces and the calves hoof and the standing straight and continues to say this because in, Ezekiel, in Exodus chapter 25, what we're going to see is that they're sitting on something that is much like the Ark of the Covenant where the cherubim would cover the Ark of the Covenant as God gave instructions to Moses. You shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. You shall make the two cherubim of gold, make them of hammered work at the two ends of the mercy seat. And this is something of what Ezekiel is seeing as these cherubim are covering this very sacred spot where the glory of God we're going to see is actually residing. As for the form of the faces, each had the face of a man. All four had the face of a lion on the right and the face of the bull on the left. And all four had the face of the eagle. And I'm not here to say that I know exactly what all those faces mean, but it's not an unfamiliar image. In Revelation chapter 4, we read this. Here in the end times, here's a, here's a Revelation 4 comes right from the, the presence of heaven. When you and I get into heaven, this is what we will see. We will see these cherubim. This image that is portrayed here is found also in Revelation 4. Revelation 4 says, Out from the throne come flashes of lightning, sounds and peals of thunder. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. 
And before the throne there was something like a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the center around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes, front and behind. The first creature was like a lion. The second creature like a calf. The third creature had the face like that of a man. And the fourth creature was like a flying eagle. You'll see those thing, same things here, the four faces. And the four living creatures, each one of them had, having six wings, are full of eyes around and within. And day and night they do not cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God, the Almighty, who was and who is and who is to come. And when the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, to him who lives forever and ever. Well, here's Ezekiel getting a really a preliminary look at the same thing that we will see when we get into heaven. So God is coming to Ezekiel, revealing himself to him. Why these four images? Here's one way to look at it. Here's how I would choose to look at it. Whether you can find commentaries that support this, go for it. But here's how I like to think about it. There's the face of a man. That's the highest, most prominent creation. Very unique. We're made in God's image. And it's interesting that Jesus in the Gospel of Luke is often portrayed as man. Luke being a doctor, showing the hum human side of Jesus. We also see that there was the lion's face. The lion, of course, majesty, power, really the exalted animal amongst the wild uh, beasts that are in the, the fields. Well, Jesus is often seen as the king. In fact, in Matthew chapter 4, he has proven to be worthy to be king. In Matthew 5 through 7, it's the kingdom message. So he's portraying himself as a king. And perhaps this lion image shows the face of Christ as king. The ox's face. The ox is uh, really known as a, as a patient servant. It's a domestic beast that is there to serve and to care for one another. It's interesting, in the Gospel of Mark, Jesus is often portrayed as a servant. Uh, he didn't come to be served, but to serve others, Mark would say. And then finally, the face of an eagle, the idea of the exalted bird, the judgment. It, it might speak of the deity of Christ. And the Gospel of John portrays Jesus as the divine one, the very first chapter, uh, that God is the living word. He is the very word of God and reveals who God is through the human flesh of Jesus Christ himself. And so it's interesting, these four images of uh, these faces, it puts into my mind the scripture that Jesus said. And could it be that might this have been somewhere in the back of his mind? And when Jesus said in Luke 24, these are the scriptures that speak of me. And they open their minds to understand the scriptures. Could it be that he spent a little bit of time saying, you know, there are these four beasts that you see in heaven, the cherubim that shows the ox and the lion and the eagle and the man. And I represent many aspects of those animal lives. And so could it be that that might have been part of opening their minds to understand the scriptures? Or could it be that someday when we get to heaven, we can ask the Father, what did you mean by those four faces? And it might enlighten us the depth of understanding of all that God intended for us to see in His Son, Jesus Christ. So that's something we have something to look forward to. Going on the passage, it says, Now as I looked at the living beings, behold, there was one wheel on the earth beside the living beings, for each of the four of them. The appearance of the wheels and their workmanship was like sparkling burl. Uh, I think that has to do with sort of a yellow color. And all four of them had the same form, their appearance and workmanship, being as if one wheel were inside of another. And whenever they moved, they moved in and out of the four directions without turning as they moved. As for their rims, uh, they were lofty and awesome. And the rims of all four of them were full of eyes round about. Now, I'd like to show you an image that was created some time ago maybe about 24 years ago. I actually taught through this passage here. And uh, one of our members here at Calvary Church, Kevin Davidson, as I preached that passage, Kevin Davidson was on the main floor drawing it out. 
And so here is what he came up with, and I love this thing. You can see this image, and uh, we're going to be talking more about the glory of God that's up here. Here are these four rims with the eyes all around, and, and it says that they were the, sort of the green color as it's described there. And uh, here are the wings and the four faces that are on the various cherubim that are located there with the lightning and the thunder that is going out there. So it gives maybe just a little bit of a sense as to what Ezekiel was seeing. But, you know, it's when it's lived out in 3D or 4D and uh, you got that crystal clear color of, of God coming down to earth to reveal himself to Ezekiel, that's pretty powerful. In fact, we'll see that Ezekiel just bowed before God. He, he couldn't remain there. So this is a beautiful image. I keep this image above my desk in my office. And it's always great to look up there and kind of remind myself what, what God wanted Ezekiel to know. That no matter what you go through, I want you to know me and how great and powerful I am. Don't, I, I don't want to ever bring God down to my size. Sort of put him in my box of my understanding. I want him to always be a little bit mysterious. I don't quite understand everything about him. Because if I understand everything about God, then I'm beginning to think maybe I'm as good as God, but I'm not. I don't know what he knows. I can't predict what he predicts. I don't know the future, but he does. So I want to rest in the glory of who God is and trust that he is a mighty, wonderful, powerful God that when we go through pandemics or you go through exile like Ezekiel, he's someone we can trust in. So that gives a little bit of an image of who God is. As the passage goes on, it says, whenever those, those went, the wheels, these went, whenever those stood still, these stood still, the Spirit of God is moving moving in all these directions. And whenever those rose, they rose from the earth, the wheels rose close beside them, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. And there came a voice that from above the expanse that was over their heads, and whenever they stood still, they dropped their wings. They dropped their wings in reverence before God. When the voice of God comes, and sometimes it, it comes like thunder, these cherubim knew God better than we know God. And they had reverence for him and they would bow before him. So the wheels, it would move but never turn directions to show that God is mobile. God is going wherever he needs to go. God is doing whatever he needs to do. There's eyes around the, the wheels of the rims that God can see everything. He knows everything. He is everywhere. He is moving wherever is needed for him to be. This shows the power of God. The omnipresence, he is everywhere. The omniscience, the, the knowledge of God, he sees everything. I give you a couple of passages of, of Chronicles in the outline that shows the eyes of God to help you understand that. And then Ezekiel 126, now above the expanse. This is, the, this is high above the, the earth. It talks about the expanse and genesis of, of all that God's creation had. That there was over their heads, there was something resembling like a throne, like a lapis lazuli, which is sort of a, I believe, a blue color in appearance. And on that which was resembled a throne, high up was a figure with the appearance of a man. And now Ezekiel is getting a vision of God. Now God is a spirit, but sometimes there's this image of God as a man. I sometimes we even wonder when he sees this image, is it, is it perhaps what we call sometimes the pre-incarnate Christ, the image of Jesus in heaven. But this is truly appearance seems to be that of the Father, but has this human appearance that he takes on to reveal it to Ezekiel. And that he noticed from the appearance of his loins and upwards something like glowing metal that looked like fire all around within it. And from the appearance of his loins and downward I saw something like fire and there was radiance all around him. This is the glory of God. It goes on to say this, And as the appearance of the rainbow and the clouds on a rainy day, so is the appearance of the surrounding radiance. Such was the appearance of the likeness of the glory of the Lord. And when I saw it, I fell on my face and heard a voice speaking. And that's Ezekiel 2. Let's just stop there. Think about that. What he's seeing is the glory of God. Now think about Christ. We're, this is Passion Week. Christ, tomorrow, is his last supper with his men. And then on Friday, he is crucified. And then on Sunday, of course, he rises again. And he's got that beautiful, glorious body, that perfect body that someday we want to have but he's still not glorified. You know, when Christ came to earth and became a little baby, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that he, he put aside the glory of heaven. He put aside the radiance of his glory so that he could take on the form of a human being, a bondservant, it says. He put aside the form of God, the glory of God, and took upon himself the form of a bondservant. 
Now Jesus is back in heaven, and once again he has the glory of God all around him. He's a radiant glory that uh, someday we will appreciate. So you can see how much Jesus gave up. We're going to get into Isaiah in a couple of weeks. And it says there in Isaiah 53 that he had no appearance that was very appealing. So he took on this bondservant form and gave up this beautiful, glorious radiance where it caused Ezekiel to fall on his face and bow before him. It caused the cherubim to fall before him and bow before him in humility and submission. And when he came to this earth, those who were the scholars of biblical truth, they didn't do that to Jesus because they didn't see the glory of, that was in the person of Christ. Christ humbled himself by giving up this glory. And here's the Father revealing that glory to Ezekiel. So before Ezekiel goes out on his mission, God says, I want you to see who I am. I want you to be overwhelmed by who I am. And that's the beauty of worship. That like Ezekiel, he fell on his face and heard a voice speaking. That we bow before God. To have a sense of the glory of God, the power of God, the radiance of God, the beauty of God, the, the, the mystery of God, that there's so much about this we don't understand, but that God is revealing a little bit of a glimpse of who He is. So before we go out on assignment, we have to spend time to know God. That's why I think every day, every day in the morning, to have a better glimpse of who God is, so that whatever happens in the course of that day, my faith is resting in Him and the confidence of who He is and the greatness of who He is so that whatever circumstances I go through, it's based upon who He is, not based upon how I feel. Because we're going to have hardships like Jeremiah and Jeremiah 20 where he says, Cursed be the day I was born. There will be difficult days. But God says, I want you to trust me in how great I am. I love this, this humility that He has. He heard the voice. It's interesting that the glory of God, as I mentioned about Jesus, if you read in Revelation chapter 1, you can see the glory of Christ in heaven, the beautiful radiance of who He is and the image that, that John had in the Revelation of 1. In Revelation 19, Christ is going to come back and is com He's coming back in radiant glory. He's not going to be riding a donkey. He's going to be riding a stallion and come back to take this earth to be His own and to rule in His kingdom. In Colossians 2, 1, all the fullness of God was in Jesus Christ. So all that glory of God was in Christ when he was in heaven. And he never lost any of his deity when he came here to earth. And then in Matthew chapter 17 is that great passage. It was called the Mount of Transfiguration. Where Jesus revealed some of that glory that we see in this image here of Ezekiel 1. He revealed some of that glory to his three closest disciples. And uh, Peter says, man, we, we should build a tabernacle to you. We, we should bow. This is, this is amazing. And uh, I don't know that he fully understood it. I'm not sure I fully understand it. But there was a little glimpse of the glory of Christ that was revealed to the uh, closest disciples that he served with. So let me, let me sum up some of these thoughts. We must have a vision of God in our hearts before we attempt to be on a mission for God. If we don't have a vision of who God is and the greatness of who He is, we might be in trouble. And then secondly, God calls us to live in His glory in the fallen world. He says, I'm not leaving you alone ex in your exile there, Ezekiel. You're by this forsaken place and by this river, uh, but I have come to be with you. I, I have revealed myself to you. You see me, you hear me, you feel me. The hand of God was upon Ezekiel. We also see that God sees and cares about our lives on the earth. No matter where we are, you would have thought God has forgotten about them when they were exiled in this forsaken land of the high desert of Babylon, of Iraq and Iran. But God was there with him. God is on the move and he fulfills his purposes. And that's why the wheels, God says, I have a plan. I'm going to move in the direction that I need to go. The spirit of God leads and the cherubim follow, the wheels follow as the Spirit of God moves in their lives. And God will exercise His judgment on the world. And He did do that, and He will do that. And we also see this, that although God is sovereign and amazing and powerful, He seeks to meet us right where we are. And that's, that's where Ezekiel was, in this presence of God that God came upon him. And we also see this, we must bow in humble adoration before the glory of the Lord. And Daniel did it, Isaiah did it, and John did it in Revelation 1. And I think sometimes God holds back. He holds back in revealing all that He wants to do or all that He is because He revealed His glory to these people. But, but sometimes He needs to hold back because we can't handle it. 
These people all fell at their feet and they were just overwhelmed by this truth. And so that's why God sent his son Jesus in the form of a person so we could know him in a way that we could receive it easier. Not be totally overwhelmed, although we should be, by who Christ is and by all that he has done. And then Ezekiel chapter 2, very quickly, going to go through this. You have it on the outline there, but I love this section. He says, now Ezekiel, I'm sending you out. Now that you know me, here's what I want you to do. And this is what he wants us to do. I think by secondary application, this, this should be true for all of us. Not just a prophet and a priest, not just someone in exile, but wherever we go and whatever our situation is, that we are there to be a a proponent of who God is and what God says. So he says to them, I'm sending you to them. And he says, it's not going to be easy. They're going to be stubborn and obstinate children. And you should say to them, thus says the Lord. He says, I want you to know who I am. So I put it this clever way, communicate God's word. I need to verbalize his truth. If I don't know his truth, I can't share his truth. And then secondly, I want to live God's word. I want to visualize it as for them, whether they listen or not, for they are a rebellious house. They will know that a prophet has been among them. There's a lot of pastors that if given this assignment, and I'm probably one of them, it's a pretty tough assignment. I want you to go to stubborn, obstinate, rebellious people who won't listen to a thing you say. There's a lot of us that say, you know, Lord, that looks like a closed door to me. Well, that was Ezekiel's assignment. And that's why Ezekiel 1, of the vision of the glory of God, preceded the assignment to live out as a servant of God. And so God wants us to go based upon his power and who he is. And we need to know the truth so we can live the truth. I want them to know that a prophet is amongst them. And you know, as we have neighbors and friends who are going through this tough times, I want our neighbors and friends and family to know that, that we are in a relationship with God that is trusting, that they know that there's a believer who follows Jesus amongst them that they have that sense of God's presence through us as well. And then people will say, you son of man, neither fear them nor fear their words. People are going to say things and do things. And so God says, I don't want you to fear them. I want you to go in confidence of who I am. Neither fear their words nor be dismayed at their presence. The word dismayed is to be broken or fearful. God says, don't be fearful in the times in which you live. If you know who the glory of God is, the glory of Christ and his presence and what he's done for us, that God says, I will be with you. I will go through that experience with them. It doesn't matter what the circumstances are. God says, Ezekiel, I'm with you. My power has been revealed to you. And then finally, don't be tempted to do what they do or be falling into the trap of the circumstances of those things that are out there. But let me wrap up with this. And next week, we'll talk about the future hope. It's interesting that Jeremiah said this. There's a lot of people like love to quote this passage. It's a wonderful passage. In fact, we have a, an image of this in our artistic rendering in our house that is hanging there. Jeremiah says this, For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. And this is to Judah. And this is as they're being taken in exile. So the same circumstances of Ezekiel, Jeremiah, the one who says, Cursed be the day I was born, because I'm being beaten up and thrown into a sister and people are, are rejecting me. Jeremiah was living a tough life. But Jeremiah also knew this at the latter part of his book. For I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans for welfare and not for calamity. To give you, and I love this, a future and a hope. I keep hearing that a lot today. We need to have a hope a hope that God is still in charge. Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me and I will listen to you. Well, this promise was given to the Jewish exiles. This was given to Israel, to Judah, if you will, as they're being stolen away in 605, 597, 586, temple, Jerusalem, totally destroyed. Daniel taken away, Jeremiah taken away, Ezekiel taken away from their family and friends with nothing to live in the parched desert. But God says, I, I, I'm not done. I've still got a plan. And we love to take that passage and apply it because God is still the same God. And say, no matter what we're going through, like the Jewish people, today, God, you still have plans. You still have a future yet. You have a future and a hope. And with this Passion Week of Christ and the resurrection, that with the resurrection power that we have experienced that they had not, that's beautiful that God says, I still have a power that is available for you, that resurrection power that I want to equip you for every good work and be with you and 
mighty and powerful ways. So as Ezekiel was commissioned and Jeremiah promises a hope that we can have a hope as well. And next week I'll show you what that hope will look like. And this is what I love about this empty grave that the women came in Luke chapter 24. The women came like Mary Magdalene. They came to the grave and they found it was empty. They couldn't figure it out. Some angels show up. They're terrified of the angels. I would be too. I don't expect to see angels when I come to a gravesite. But there the angels were. And I love these words of the angels. Well, they said, He is not here, Jesus, but He is risen. And then I want to highlight in yellow these words. Remember how He spoke to you while He was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered His words. This is all about a Bible study on Wednesday nights. It's all about remembering God's words. That the words of God would stir my heart to know that there is a future and a hope. And when these women remembered, oh yeah, he, he said that. Now I understand it better. The more I know what Jesus said, the more I remember what Jesus said, and the more comfort I have that, yes, there is a future and a hope. And that's the message of Ezekiel. We'll look at that future and look at that hope next Wednesday night. I invite you to join us once again. So let me pray for us that God would bless and provide for us even this special week as we remember this, that He is not here, for He is risen. Let me pray. Father God, we thank You for the life of Christ, that He went through a miserable death as well for us. He died in our place to pay for our sins. And as we put our faith and trust and believe in Him and repent, God, He will forgive us and that we can have that future and that hope in our lives as well. Lord, help us to remember your words like these women, because that helps us to know that, yes, no matter what, there is a future and a hope that we can rest in as well. So thank you for it all. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. See you next week.